Hey everyone, this is Carlos. I'm the CEO at Product School, and today I'm here with a very special guest. His name is Steve Blank, and he requires no introduction. Um, he built, he participated in eight different high tech startups. He's also the co creator of the Lean Startup Movement, and he's also a professor at different universities such as Berkeley or Stanford. Hey, Steve. Hey, Carlos. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm excited to, to be here today. It's a pleasure to, to meet you in, in person. I, I read your first book, Four Steps to Epiphany, and, and I've been obviously applying the Lean Startup Movement, uh, the Lean Startup Principles for, for a while as, as a founder. I, I was reading at your bio on your website, and it said that you retired technically in 1999 after building eight different startups. However, your bio after that is, is really, really long, right? Like you mentioned how you create different courses, you, you also uh, invested in different companies. So why don't you tell us a little bit more about kind of your, your life uh, after you, know, you build those startups, what you learn and what you're trying to do today? Well, Carlos, one of the nice things about being retired is retired actually means you get to do whatever you want. Uh, so, so, you know, my retirement career was kind of like my entrepreneurial career. I just kind of followed my passion. Um, and that's a big idea. You know, I did startups because they were interesting and I learned things, uh, even though at the end I discovered you could actually make money at the same time. Um, but, but I was actually more interested in what I could learn. And, and, um, uh, so since I retired, you know, the first thing I started getting curious about was how startups were built and were there better ways to build them? And to make a long story short, which we could talk about, is, is learning that startups weren't smaller versions of large companies, that the startups were very different. And, and so the lean startup movement came from there. Um, and so I started building classes in, um, in the first Berkeley and then Stanford and then Columbia University to teach entrepreneurs a different method uh, to kind of do that. And so my, my last couple of decades were kind of following my passion. I also get to, got to be a public official in California. And I got to sit on environmental non, uh, nonprofits, NGOs. Um, but as I said, retirement just means, at least here, uh, you get to follow your passion and do what you want. I love that. And, and you, you talked about startups, which is a very confusing term because I see a lot of startups saying, we are not a startup, we're a large company, we're growing really fast. And we see a lot of big companies saying, we are a startup within a startup. So yeah. why don't we clarify the, the term of a startup? So, so let me go all the way back to, to you know, what is a startup? Um, you, you know, it, it turns out that um, that word really does confuse people. So you know, I have friends who I live on the coast of California who surf, and if they um, if they could afford it, they'd be in the ocean 24 hours a day. But they have to pay the rent, so they put up a sign that says "Surfing Lessons." You know, 10 o'clock to 11:30. So they teach surfing to to feed their passion, but their passion isn't teaching; their passion is surfing. They are entrepreneurs. They meet the definition. They don't work for anybody. They're following their passion. They they're, they're, have their own business, but they're actually lifestyle entrepreneurs. That is, their business is really not their passion. And by the way, they, they fall in the category of entrepreneurs. There are other people, another category of entrepreneurs are people who open a restaurant or people who do website consulting or build websites or are marketing consultants. They don't work for anybody. They have their own business. They may have one or two helpers. Um, and, and by the way, their business might be quite profitable. Some of them might actually make a you know, million dollars a year. Um, but in fact, if you really think about it, their business has no scale and has no multiple. That is, they, they will get nice revenue and it is, you could support the family and cousins and whatever, and you could hire local people, but you're never gonna get risk capital. That is angel capital or venture capital because the returns on that business are nothing like what you would get for a scalable startup, but they are entrepreneurs. In fact, in the United States, 98% or 99% of all businesses are small businesses, but they are entrepreneurs. The third category is the one, hopefully a, a good number of our audience comes from are people who want to build what I call scalable startups. Startups that in fact, the goal is to get large. Um, and the goal is to, you know, either large in revenue or large in users or large something. And in fact, um, that requires hiring not just your relatives or your neighbors, but extraordinary people from all around your region or your country. And it requires sometimes 
external capital for growth um, that will invest in a risky venture in exchange for ownership for something that might give them very large returns. And that's what a, a startup kind of looks like. That's a, a scalable startup. It's what we typically find in innovation clusters and you know, in, in different areas of Brazil or South America or Silicon Valley or you know, in, in China and, and Beijing or Shanghai or other places. Um, and then there are corporate entrepreneurs. There are people who are trying to do entrepreneurship inside of a large organization uh, that's 99% executing an existing business model. They're trying to create new business models. Um, so, so I just wanted to give you and your, your listeners this taxonomy of like, who's an entrepreneur? And, and by the way, one of the, one of the reasons I remind my students of this is sometimes it gets really confusing is if you're a small business entrepreneur, but you're trying to raise venture capital and you keep getting turned down, you, you know, you get mad because they don't just get it. Actually, you're the one who just doesn't get it. It's not that your business is bad. It's your business doesn't have that potential return of, of a hundred or a thousand to one. It might be making good money, but it's not a scalable business. Um, so, so that's one reminder. The, the second one, which I think was actually the question you asked, which is about entrepreneurs in the large companies. Was that the question you asked? Uh, well, no, you actually touched on it. It's like really glad having some clarity around what is a startup because yeah. you know, I also live in California, right? There is so much, yeah. so, so many startups where there is, in a way, be small business owners who maybe have a restaurant or a co working space. Right. And, and the question for them is like, okay, when are you raising your next, your next round? And by yeah. definition, maybe that business is not set up to be startup, but that doesn't mean right. that it's not a nice, profitable business. Yes. And it doesn't mean they can't raise money from the bank or government or even exactly. relatives, et cetera. And it doesn't mean that they don't have the opportunity to, to open multiple restaurants if they want. And then it might be a scalable thing. Um, but they are entrepreneurs. They're just not scalable entrepreneurs. My definition of a startup is a temporary organization designed to search for a repeatable and scalable business model. And that's a really interesting phrase because if you're doing a startup at least a, a scalable startup, the goal is not to be a startup. The goal is to be a large company. So it's a temporary organization. It, it, there's no such thing as an eight-year-old startup. There's a two-year-old startup with a six-year-old failure attached to it. Um, designed to search. Well, that's kind of interesting. What, what's the search part? Well, large companies execute what's known as a business model, but startups actually search for business models. That is. In a large company, you know who your customers are, you know competitors, you know pricing, you know features, et cetera. In a startup, you just think you do on day one, but you're actually searching for this thing called product market fit. And, and so you're searching for repeatable and scalable business model, something that you do on Monday actually works on Friday, that works next week, and that scales. And scale is the key idea about a scalable startup, is that it grows large, hopefully if you're successful, exponentially. So that's a very long answer to your first question. Of. It, you know, it is great because on the other side of the spectrum, I, I think about large companies that say when you're you know, trying to recruit uh, talent, they would say, we are, we are startup within a startup. And, and I can see the edge case in some case, if they're building something within an organization, but yeah. I think sometimes they use it to say, hey, we're agile, we innovate, we're cool. Yeah. So... So one of the interesting things, and I'll just remind your audience because it requires a little context, is that in the 20th century, you know, startups were, to a large company, were jokes. I mean, they, you know, no, no large company woke up in the morning and worried about a startup because startups couldn't raise a lot of money and, and industries were mostly stable, et cetera. Now in the 21st century, Corporate CEOs have their heads exploding because everything they learned in business school five years ago is completely obsolete, except for maybe accounting. Um, and, and I mean, not that they've gotten dumber, it's that the world has gotten a lot more disruptive. First of all, startups, some of them raise more money than companies have for R&D. That, that was just never possible before. You know, the internet has changed the value of brands. You could create a brand now in a year where it used to take 10, 20 years to create value. Pricing is transparent. You know, China is a manufacturer, et cetera. And so large companies have realized that they're being disrupted by a series of forces that never existed before. 
And so they're all trying to answer that question of how do I be innovative? And a good number of them have tried to adopt these lean methods that startups use. The problem is, is for most large companies, it's turned into innovation theater rather than innovation. And what I mean by that is, oh, look at our accelerator and we have great coffee cups and, and look, you could bring your dog to work or you know whatever. And so the question to ask any large company who tells you how innovative they are and, and they have a corporate accelerator or look at our beanbag chairs, you wanna ask them is how many of these innovative ideas that have done by your innovation group actually have gotten into the hands of customers? And the answer, unfortunately, for a lot of them is, well, look at our great demos. No, no, I don't want to look at the demo. <laughs> Everybody has demos. Show me something that your sales force is actually selling in quantity that came out of this innovation process. And what you find out is most of the time is it's not that there aren't innovative people in large companies, but large companies have processes and procedures and OKRs, and metrics, et cetera, that tend to strangle innovation in its crib. And unless you fix the processes, um, then innovation really doesn't deliver in large organizations. Doesn't mean none of them do that, but it's much harder than just let's stand up an accelerator or an incubator inside of a large corporation, or let's paint the walls pink or something. So you mentioned the uh, term Lean, you're one of the co-creators of the Lean Startup movement. And I remember when I got my hands on that book, a Lean Startup, I think it was 2010, I literally shred it the first night and I was so excited. That was like literally when I was building my, my first startup. Obviously the world has changed quite a bit uh, during the last uh, 10 or so years. So what would you say are some of the principles that still remain true today? And how has that, the, you know, the, this set of principles evolved over time? Yeah, so some of the basic principles, and I, I still teach this, and it's still amazing because it violates. So some of the principles of lean, just before I tell you what in your audience what they are, violates the kind of passion of an entrepreneur. If you're a great entrepreneur, you have a great idea, and the first thing you want to do is raise money and go build the idea. Um, I mean, that's a natural DNA. Of, that's what I used to do is, hey, and here are my slides. Good, let's raise money. Good, I raised money. Here are my slides. Go buy it. People gave me money. Come on, let's go. When instead, and, and this is just really hard, is that all you have on day one, which is still true, is a series of untested hypotheses. And I use the word hypotheses because it's a fancy word students in universities like, but it actually means you're just guessing. You're guessing about a lot of things on day one. You're guessing about the problem you think you're solving. In fact, you don't even think about the problem you're solving. You think about what a cool product this is. Well, well, wait a minute, it's a cool product, why? Well, everybody will want it. Well, how do you know that? Well, I want it. Well, okay, well, who else wants it? Well, my co-founder wants it. Okay, if you two buy it, is that enough to you know, make the company successful? No. Well, how will you know? Well, we'll build it, we'll raise all this money. Well, maybe we ought to ask a couple of people. Well, who should I ask? Well, how about we figure out who you think might want it? Okay, I can write that down. Great, let's go out and talk to them. Oh, no, I need to build a product first. No, you don't. <laughs> Why don't you figure out if this thing, if you build it, would it solve a problem? Or if it's entertainment, would they play it? Or what are they playing now? Or what are they using now? Or that is, every startup is built on the set of assumptions that unless you test them, you only find out later after you spent money, built products, you know, hire people, et cetera, that you're wrong. And so the, one of the key ideas about, uh, about the whole lean methodology is, there are no facts inside your building, so get the heck outside. And, and the part I created of Lean, the one of three pieces, is called customer development, which basically says, look, not only are there no facts inside the building, the odds of you being smarter than the collective intelligence of your potential customers is probably as close to zero as any safe bet. Um, so why don't we just spend a little amount of time, not run focus groups, but actually test hypotheses. And so while we're doing that, we now could do something we never could have done in the 20th century and actually show them iterative and incremental versions of a product using something called agile engineering. That was Eric Reese's contribution that says, Steve invented customer development, but, but no one uses waterfall anymore. That is the serial process of building products. Software and hardware could be built iteratively. So why don't we take that and we could search for something called product market fit. 
Have we found the right customers with the right feature set? Oh, look at that. You know, we have, or no, we haven't. So we're allowed to iterate the customers, excuse me, iterate the features, and also change maybe what potential customers we're talking to and maybe change prices, et cetera. And the third part of uh, Lean <clears throat> was simply, well, what hypotheses, what guesses or assumptions should I be testing? And that came from someone named Alexander Osterwalder who created something called the Business Model Canvas, which if um, your viewers haven't seen it, it's worth going out and, and looking up the canvas. It's basically a single piece of paper with nine hypotheses on it. Who are your customers? What are you building for them? And he has a fancy word called value proposition, but it's what, what hardware or software or service, et cetera, are you providing those customers? Great. What's your distribution channel? Is it as simple as an app store, whether it's Google Play or Apple, or, or is it a retail distribution or something or licensing? Um, how are you going to get, keep and grow those customers, you know, customer relationships? Um, how are you going to make money? First of all, what's the strategy? Is it a direct sale? Is it a license? Is it a freemium product? And then kind of on the background, what are the key strategic activities you need to be expert at? If you're building an AI company, you ought to have as a co-founder some AI people. And so which resources do you need inside? Uh, and what resources for, can you partner with third parties for? So activities, resources, and partners. And then finally, what are the costs? Those are some of the key assumptions now of, about what you're doing in, outside the building. Now, if you think about it, these three components, customer development, agile engineering, and business model canvas are what we call the lean startup. And it allows us to do things that entrepreneurs never had permission to do. And we never even had a language to do in the 20th century. And can I explain what those are, Carla? Sure. Yeah. So in the 20th century, it's, it's hard to believe this, but trust me, I, I had to live this. The way you would build a product is the founders would have a great idea and they put together PowerPoint slides, sound familiar, okay. You, you go raise money, all right, sound familiar. You know, if you got money from a venture capitalist, they would bless your idea, put holy water over it by handing you millions of dollars. And you would assume that you were genius. You would assume the only problem between you and retirement was building the product because VCs said you were a genius. They gave you money, they read your plan. Oh, by the way, you wrote a business plan with a five-year forecast. That is, you were predicting the future based on no facts, but that's okay. They, they, they agreed that, that that was gonna happen. And then you built the product with what was called waterfall development. That is a serial step-by-step -step process. You, you wrote a marketing spec and engineering turned it into a, an engineering specification document. And then, you locked engineers in a room and you fed them soda and caffeine for, you know, and free food for like, and believe it or not, products and software and hardware took years to develop, not days or weeks or months. And then when the product was about to be released, engineering tested it in an alpha test and beta test, just whether it was buggy enough, they really didn't care whether customers wanted it. They wanted to know whether it crashed the system or, or killed people or something else. And then you ship the product. And everybody had a big party. We had a, what a product launch and everybody would high five each other. And, and then the first board meeting, people would ask the VP of sales, how are we doing? And he or, he or she, but back then it was mostly he, would say, great pipeline, which meant, oh, lots of interest, but no orders. And this would continue for five or six months until they realized no orders were coming. And so they'd fire the VP of sales. Um, and they replace the VP of sales and a new VP of sales would come in and they do the same thing. Uh, and then they fire, not the VP of sales because the new VP of sales would blame it on the VP of marketing. When, and finally, like the company would shut down. You know, so what's a couple interesting things. in, in yeah. this part, like um, my, my company is actually inspired by, by your customer development methodology. We, we teach product management and I felt that pain so many times where Product didn't, ex didn't have a seat at the table. You, you mentioned it's the VP of sales or the VP of marketing, maybe in some cases the VP of technology, but product was almost there in the, in the uh, hidden, right? Yes. And, and now we're seeing more organizations that have a CPO role or a VP of product that is able to at least co-create co with market and not have to wait for market to tell them what to build and then they just go and go, you know, yes. take more. And, and I wanted to tell you this long story of how it used to work to point out a couple of interesting things. The only time back in the 20th century, and some companies now, you had permission 
to change the features of the product is when you fired an executive. Because if I fired the VP of sales, you go, oh, well, maybe it was missing these features. So then you would add features. You fired another executive, you'd say, well, maybe we're talking to the wrong customers. If you think about what Lean allows us to do now, and this is a key concept, it's this word pivot. And a pivot means a substantive change to any part of the business model canvas or any part of your business model. A pivot gives entrepreneurs permission to say, I've been out of the building, I've been testing my hypothesis about features or product or pricing, and, and it, it's not working over here, so let me change who my customers are, or let me try a different experiment with, they're telling me it's features three, seven, and 12 they pay money for. Let me prioritize those and see what happens. Once you have that permission, that's what allows you to be rapidly agile. That allows you to move with like a blur. And, and so, so this idea of a pivot just never existed before. This idea of a minimum, what we call minimum viable product, this idea of testing very early on, iteratively, never existed before either. And, and I find fascinating that some of those concepts, pivot, minimum viable product, yep. product market fit, yep. um, getting out of building, maybe these days it's yep. more about getting out of Slack or your inbox, uh, whatever or that Zoom. may be, or Zoom, yeah. they, stay, they stay true over yes. 10 years later. Yes. Yes, because the nature of business is, is kind of fundamental. I mean, what's, what's really interesting is, uh, you, you know, when we started <clears throat> building this methodology, I said, ah, maybe it's a fad or maybe I'm wrong. You know, in fact, I used to sit with Eric Reese every once in a while and go, what if we're wrong? <laughs> you know, we're, we're making everybody do the wrong thing. It, it turns out we now have enough data to say, Listen, it, it, it's somebody will probably come up with something much better, hopefully in another 20 years. But there seems to be some fundamental things about startups that we have discovered that we just weren't doing correctly for the first 25 years or so. Um, and, and I'm kind of um, I'm kind of both surprised and happy that these things have turned out to be fundamental truths about um, building companies, not not just fads. Um, we have discovered, though, a couple of new things, Carlos. It's one of the things you, you asked earlier. Um, you know, I used to insist that customer dis uh, discovery, that is the first part of getting out of the building, had to be done in person. Because I said you needed to watch people's facial expression and you need to watch them whether they're looking at their watch or, you know, actually reading their phone when you're trying to talk to them or, or whatever. And I said, well, you can't do that via email or telephone or, or a survey monkey. That's not customer discovery um, until the pandemic. And then <laughs> getting out of the building meant you were gonna get die or get arrested. Um, and so we ran a, a huge experiment of, can you do sufficient customer discovery via Zoom or Google Meet or any type of video? And the answer for, I'd say most cases is, there's no, there's no reason on earth now to do your first customer discovery visit in person. In fact, it's a waste of time. And the reason why is it's not as good as in person. That is, Zoom will never replace, you know, watching everybody's eye rolls next to each other or them doing this or actually people are actually reading their phone. But, but you could do five to 10 more of them in a day than you could driving across town or flying across country or whatever. And so volume here makes up for kind of the, the missing pieces of, of connectivity. You still need, so, so let me just put that as a stake in the ground. The first pass of customer discovery, you know, unless it's really, you're gonna to get to visit, you know, the capital of your country and the president's gonna meet you. It's probably worth passing on a, on a, which sometimes happens, or you're gonna go on an aircraft carrier or visit something else. Uh, but subsequent meetings, that is follow on meetings where discussions are now getting hands-on and um, because it's really hard to demo an MVP you know, that has physical use or people want to push buttons or whatever, that's harder. And, and so it's not like we can eliminate in-person meetings completely, but it's changed for me. And I invented the methodology, my mindset about, no, 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 let's kind of adapt and adopt what's just happened here. We've run a giant science experiment. So customer discovery and customer validation is now kind of a hybrid of doing rapid in, you know, in, uh, Zoom meetings to gather as much data as you can, 
and then judiciously, that is selectively pick which meetings do you need to follow up in person? People need to hold products, you need to see the physical building, if it's hardware or the size of things or, or other equipment in the room or other whatever. Does that make sense, Carlos? Totally. Um, I, I was going to add one thing that I've observed over the years is how technology has become much more visual. Now yes. building a product doesn't require that much of a technical expertise. Meaning I remember when I was in San Francisco participating in weekend hackathons, we had two days to actually use the business model canvas, get off the building, interview customers. And the end goal of that weekend was, was to have a presentation. And, and that was it. These days, those hackathons are much more about building something because you can prototype, yes. you can design and, and get, you know, that's need to be an end product, but the definition of the MVP uh, has evolved a little bit, I guess. Yes. And, and in fact, if you think about the underlying cause of why that is, is, um, you know, open source has dramatically changed our ability to stand. We were basically standing on everybody's shoulders. Um, it's hard to believe when in the 20th century, hardware and software was an individual craft. That is, we all redid our, our work time and time again because no one shared anything. And, you know, just GitHub by itself changed, probably changed the world, but there's also open hardware platforms, et cetera. The other piece, by the way, that's radically changed everybody's life. And we take it for granted now, like we take electricity for granted is Amazon Web Services. You know, when I was an entrepreneur, the, the, what you did with your first round of funding was you bought a computer. I mean, a mini computer, right? And you typically bought a deck vax, whether you're building hardware or software, it cost you a million dollars. And then you spent another million dollars on software to run on top of it. Nowadays, I tell that to my students and they go, you know, like, were you born in 1850? I mean, when did that happen? <laughs> and, totally. and it turns out we just take for granted that computing is um, infinite computing is just a click away. Um, and so think about it, open source, um, you know, uh, computing is a utility. And more importantly, conferences like this, when I wanted to understand how innovation and entrepreneurship work, I had to have coffee with someone. And luckily I lived in Silicon Valley and I was limited by my coffee bandwidth. Um, <laughs> nowadays, everybody <laughs> kind of who's watching this on Twitch and everywhere else, your problem is how to sort out all the information you're getting from for innovation and entrepreneurship because there's a million pieces of advice and you're you know some of them in fact probably all of them if you add them up are mutually contradictory so you're now your problem is is what is the right path to take rather than i don't have enough information and there's more books on lean and startups and whatever um, oh, yeah. in multiple languages some of them i don't even recognize um, yeah, and, and i think the cost of, of office now with remote work has also decreased significantly Right. So that's the, thank you. So now that's the started pre pandemic, but now for sure, this idea of remote work was kind of, well, maybe, yeah, we'll hire somebody outside of Silicon Valley. Yeah. We'll have a remote office. Now it's like, like, you know, convince me we, why we need an office. Um, and, and what this really does is it's globalized entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship. The only thing that's still probably regional, um, and, and I think that's also breaking down, but probably at a slower level is, you know, the first pre-pandemic, um, you know, angel funding was available almost everywhere. I mean, you could probably raise a good enough pre-seed or early stage in, in almost any country or region. I mean, I'm sure you, your viewers could tell me the towns that they can't, but, but, but that might be a function of their idea rather than the money. But in most places there's, and by the way, that never existed. And, and But what I saw during the pandemic is venture capitalists actually using Zoom to fund things in places they would never fund um, and, and writing, you know, C checks or Series A, depending where you are. I mean, millions of dollars of, of money for people they've never even physically saw on purpose in, in, in person. Some of that is changing back, but some of it is still going on, which kind of globalized, you know, the next round of funding. But what still requires, I think... Um, access to an innovation cluster is if you need capital at scale, probably north of 20 million or 50 million or hundred million dollars, there's still only certain places in the world though are expanding where you could raise that capital, right? Maybe 10 or 15 places. Um, and some of them still require physical access or at least you know, physical connections to those folks. Um, 
you know, that'll eventually change as well. Um, uh, but, but it's really interesting to see how, how innovation uh, and entrepreneurship not only is spread, but if you remember without risk capital, and what I mean by risk capital is not your bank, not, you, not your parents or friends, but crazy people who are equally insane as you are, um, who, who, who finance startups. If you think about it, having uh, in, um, entrepreneurs and, and innovators in a region without risk capital is like one hand clapping. It doesn't work. You need both of those to, to exist for you to have an innovation cluster um, or else people, those innovators go elsewhere. Does that make sense? Totally, and let's double click on that because I'm uh, actually taking a question from the audience. Um, I can imagine how a new startup uh, has an easier time em embracing some of these principles because they don't have that much resistance to change. However, for the folks who are working in larger organizations, what would you say are some ways for those large organizations to kind of take some baby steps and incorporate some of those principles? Like quick examples. Are we talking about acquiring startup? Are we talking about hiring uh, younger, more innovative people to kind of spark things up? Like how have you, you seen this being successfully implemented? Yeah, you, you know, I let's start with the things that don't work well. This is when the the managing directors or the board of directors tell the CEO, you need to be innovative. And they, and they tell someone that says, oh, we need an incubator. And they set up a fancy thing. And, and, and all those things die inside the incubator. That is, they're, they hire smart people and create great demos. And, and the rest of the organization says, well, it's, it's not on my list. you know, Or wait a minute, this is a great product, but it'll kill our existing products. Or, or engineering says, well, to scale this thing, it's they used a different API and, and a different, you know, stack. It doesn't match anything we're building. You know, I'm, I'm not budgeted or scheduled for this. And, and so the first thing that needs to happen in a large company is actually to have a innovation pipeline and process that's agreed by the exec staff, not as a single point organization. I, I've usually seen those fail miserably because the rest of the organization is not simply aligned. And, and let me give you a maybe a, another a taxonomy because I like to think about how to organize things. About 30 years ago, a consulting firm uh, called McKinsey came up with a model for large company innovation, which I still think is worth thinking about. They said there are three horizons or three types of innovation in a large corporation. Horizon one is hopefully what every company is already doing. And that is adding more features to, to existing products. Right, you're making existing products. It's continuous improvement of existing products, and hopefully you're doing that with a combination of great engineering, but also great insight from your customers. Hopefully you're getting data from the field, and you're watching competitors, and you're watching trends, etc. And Horizon One innovation belongs inside of existing P&L groups or functional organizations. It doesn't require a new org. Horizon Two innovation, though, is maybe you know, like. I have some great products, but maybe I should find some different customers, or maybe I could find a different distribution channel. I've been selling things retail. Maybe some things could go online, or I, I'm online. Maybe you know some retail channels or some partners, etc. That requires sometimes in the existing division, but sometimes requires a standalone group outside. Same, some parts of the business model are the same, but some might actually create conflict inside the organization. And anytime there's conflict wired in, you want to figure out how to build a, uh, both a separate group, but that's tied in, with incentives to the, to the core. And then the third type of horizons, uh, the horizon is horizon three. These are disruptive innovation. This is Apple doing the iPhone. They were a computer company. Um, this is Netflix becoming a Hollywood studio. <laughs> at least I don't know if there's Netflix in, in your country, but in you know Netflix used to like mail DVDs to you. Right? Like how did they become a studio? Those were pretty disruptive and require different standalone groups because in fact they threaten the existing organizations. So that's idea one. Idea two is that's if a company wants to build innovation inside. But you remember. Large companies have a lot more moves than startups. Large companies could acquire IP, intellectual property. Uh, they could acquire, hire they could just buy people, you know, or small teams. Uh, they could buy or acquire product lines. They could acquire, do joint ventures, or they could acquire entire companies. 
those are moves that startups are, who are typically just focused on executing their own business model don't have. The problem with large companies when they do that is I've seen a, as having sit on both public and private boards on both sides of this, when large companies do acquisitions, they almost always kill the innovation. Um, and they almost always kill it because they don't understand the phase of the company they're acquiring. Um, at some phases, and I won't go in it here, but it is worth thinking about, you certainly do want to deeply integrate all the functions together. Great, we just got all their people, they now have our HR system and our finance system and our sales force and yeah, 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 the employees. But, but there are other times when you do that in a life cycle of a large company acquiring a startup, you kill every piece of innovation you thought you were going to acquire and all the people quickly leave. They might stay for their one year earnout or whatever, but, but you can almost write the script of what happened here. And it's what happens is that people who acquire really don't understand the culture and what are the innovation drivers and the thing that they acquired. By the way, this is a pretty easy fix, um, but, it's, but, but it's usually understood after you've screwed it up. Um, so, um, I, 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 Carlos, I hate to tell you I forgot your question, but I hope I answered some of it. No, you actually touched on it. It was about like different ways a, a large organization can incorporate some of these lean startup principles by collaborating yes. with startups. And I think you broke it down nicely. And, you know, there's a, a fundamental question that I keep coming to mind as, as you talk about validating hypotheses, getting out of the building, testing ideas. It's like when it's so easy to lie to, to cheat on our set, right? And, and be like, okay, I went out of the building. I asked all of these questions. My users told me what I wanted. Great. Yeah. I'm going to build. So what are some like good ways for us to stay honest and also stop to not over analyze and question and, you know, at the same time start building? Yeah. So the biggest, uh, the, you know, I, I think I started with telling you the passion of an entrepreneur is so let's start building. So for those of you who watching who feel that way, you know, screw this process. I was, welcome to the club. I mean, like I felt that way for the 20 years I did this. And, and by the way, the, the whole idea of lean is not to diminish that passion or to slow it up. It's a big idea. I want everybody to hear this. For me, the whole process of getting out of the building was to validate the founder's hypotheses. It wasn't to question them. It was to the same, assume you're right. Just humor me, just humor me. I mean, just, you know, I'm an old guy. Make, make me happy and talk to 10 people who say you're absolutely right. And of course they talk to 10 people and go, well, I must've talked to the wrong 10 people. And then, then you talk to another 10, uh-oh. Um, and, and so that's when reality meets like, um, and so the, the simple test is, look, why don't you humor me and let's write down what problem do you think you're solving? And by problem, as I said earlier, is are you entertaining people or is the hypothesis that people will want better X or Y? Let's just make sure that someone other than you has that problem. Forget about the product. Don't take your slides. Just go talk to 10 people about the problem that you think they have. And of course, you can, almost always they come back and well, no one else has the problem or, or yeah, they have that problem. But what I used to discover, the one I thought, it was number 17 and the problems they have and they were only buying solutions to the top five. <laughs> I wasn't even on the list. So I was kind of right, right? But, and then, so you will change and you'll understand that. The next thing is now test the solution. Oh, that's when I get out the canvas and whatever. Yeah, I understand the problem. And obviously they want these features that look like this. Just talk to 10 people. <laughs> Uh-oh, <laughs> no product market fit. Now, you don't have to do that. You could raise a ton of money and in some places in the world and just hire people and you know do it. And if it's wrong, hire more people, et cetera. And, and you're actually iterating on someone else's cash. Um, you know, no one is gonna shoot you and no one's gonna put you in jail. It's just not efficient. If you're great at the lean process, it's very quick. It's almost transparent. Um, and it is kind of an honest broker on yourself. The best way I've seen this work, Carlos, is when your board members at board meetings stop asking about first year's revenue and start saying, well, what did you learn in your first 20 interviews with customers? That's all a board has to do in the first board meeting. All of a sudden, if that culture is set, that we're not hitting you with a stick to meet some imaginary hockey stick, but in fact, the premise of actually getting to any 
exponential growth is based on product market fit. Tell me what you learned either in you know, building MVPs or talking to people or whatever, and what's your process for doing so? If board members start just simply asking CEOs that, then that will kind of get baked into the culture. And I've seen great boards do that. Obviously, they care about exponential growth because that's where liquidity is, is somewhere up here. But it usually happens more efficiently when that's an, an integral part of the process. I love that. And I think that, that mindset of like, what did you learn? Or learning yes. fast instead of just failing fast and then punishing right. for failure. It right. really changes the mindset to be more focused on growth and long-term results rather than like, okay, here is your return on this specific mm. idea. Yep. Cool, Steve. It's been a, a pleasure to, to chat with you. Thank you so much. Um, but yeah, it's been it's been awesome. Thank you.